The ninth psalm should be paired with Psalm 10. In fact, I believe that they are one psalm that has been divided into two halves. You can see there uh, that it is an acrostic, the poetic form that is defined as a, a psalm that is based on the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse starts with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, in this case, there are two verses per letter of the alphabet, more or less. There are some variations with that, and it breaks down a bit more in, the, in Psalm 10. But it's very clear that Psalm 9 and 10 were originally one psalm that was divided into two. Uh, the evidence for this is, first of all, the acrostic structure continues. So if you were to think of an acrostic as uh, every letter of the alphabet in English from A to Z, or in Hebrew from Aleph to Tav, about halfway through that alphabet, you would uh, split it and then go to the next psalm. Uh, so that's what's happened here. We have the entire Hebrew alphabet stretched over two psalms. So that suggests that they were originally one. We also note that there is no title for Psalm 10. There are only four psalms in the entire uh, book one of the psalms that do not have titles. And so this is a good reason to believe that uh, Psalm 10 is actually part of Psalm 9. The Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, treats them as one psalm. And uh, many modern versions do that well. The Catholic version of the Bible, as well as the Greek and Eastern Orthodox versions, follow the Septuagint here. And the two psalms express a common theme of justice for the poor, although each of them has a different focus. Psalm 9 is classified as a lament, and so we begin by looking at the characteristics of a lament, and we see that uh, we're using the name of God primarily, Yahweh, in terms of address. Uh, verse 2 also has most high, Elayon. The first half of this psalm is entirely an expression of confidence in God's just judgment. Moving to the second half of the psalm again, I highlight there the terms of address as well as the different uh, movements of lament. We begin with confidence in verses 11 and 12, and then a request in verse 13, followed by in verse 14, motivation. Uh, this is one of those rarer elements of lament. In this case, the psalmist is saying, be gracious to me and see my affliction, because if you keep me alive, then I will be able to worship you. I may recount your praises in the gates of Jerusalem. So it is a rationale for listening to my prayer, God, that you would raise me up so I can praise you. And then the psalm again returns to some expressions of confidence, and then finally a request. Now when we get to Psalm 10, we'll see that it has a great deal of complaining, because that's the one element that's, that's missing from this lament if you just take Psalm 9 by itself. This is according to Muth Laben, and that is translated as the death of the sun. This apparently was a tune uh, that would be our best guess. Now, we know that David did lose a son, uh, the death of his son with Bathsheba. Perhaps that's a reference here. Perhaps there's just a, another tune out there named Muth uh, Laben that would have been familiar uh, to the listeners at the time. I would suggest that verse 4 is the key verse of the psalm. It's the controlling image of the psalm, and that is of Yahweh seated on the throne, judging with justice. This is the theme that we come back to again and again in Psalms 9 and 10. Another key word or words that we see in the psalm are terms for the nations, for the peoples. And so this reminds us, of course, that Yahweh was not just a God of Israel, but the God of the entire world, of all nations. He was not just a regional deity, unlike the other deities of the ancient world. Uh, God was the God of all the nations. And it seems that this lament has to do primarily with these kind of societal, national uh, rivals, uh, uh, both in terms of people and in terms of gods that were opposed to the God of justice. Verse 6 reminds us of, of something that was very true of the ancient world as it is today, that the ancient world was, was uh, littered with ancient ruins, that David could go throughout the, the land of Israel and he would find in various places these, these everlasting ruins, these, these uh, ancient cities that were no more. They were just piles. Uh, the technical term for that in archaeology is a tell, a T-E-L-L. -L. And uh, these were found throughout the, uh, the ancient Near East. The memory of these cities, the peoples had completely perished, and so David has a, a very strong metaphor there for uh, what happens to those who oppose the justice of God.
The psalm is also interspersed with several verses that reference the poor, the needy, the oppressed, and so I've highlighted those there in purple. Moving to the second half of the psalm, we have another poetic term, higayon, which is related to the word haga or meditation. So we don't know what that means, uh, but it's probably related to that word and another salah that we note there. Here you see again a lot of references to the nations and the peoples, and then references to the afflicted, to the needy, and to the poor as well. A couple of terms here to define the daughter of Zion. This is a poetic reference to the city of Jerusalem. So we're talking about the gates of Jerusalem. David wants to recount God's praises in Jerusalem. There is probably a, a symmetry here with the gates of death from which God uh, has lifted David and then placed him in the gates of uh, Jerusalem, the daughter of Zion. Speaking of death, in verse 17, we have a, the word Sheol, which is the Hebrew word for the realm of the dead. Also some symmetry in verses 13 and 16, or 15 rather, uh, where David says, you have lifted me up from the gates of death while the nations have sunk in the pit that they have made. So clear parallel thought there, as well as in verses 12 and 18, where uh, God doesn't forget the cry of the needy and the afflicted. Verses 15 and 16 are similar in many ways to Psalm 7, where what Psalm 7 says about the individual, how the wicked man uh, digs a pit and then falls into it. David says the same thing is true of the nations. The nations have sunk in the pit that they have made. They've been trapped in the, 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 uh, the trap that they have set for themselves. Now moving on to our interpretive lenses first. The author, of course, is, uh, is David, and this seems to be a lament over national enemies, not the personal enemies that we saw in Psalms 3 through 7. In terms of theology, we again see the verse 4 is, is the key verse here, but others express this truth as well, that the Lord sits enthroned. He's established his throne for justice. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. And so it states very strongly that God is the just and universal judge. And because of that, he is a stronghold for the oppressed. So the oppressed experience God's judgment as a strengthening thing, while the uh, victimizers, the oppressors, experience God's justice in a punitive way. We see this again in the second half of the Psalm, verse 11, that God sits enthroned in Zion. He is sovereign and that God will do vengeance on, on the wicked. Uh, verse 16, he has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The needy are not forgotten. The hope of the poor shall not perish forever. In those verses, we see the two sides of God's justice. Uh, they, there are two sides of the coin. On the one hand, there is a judgment that is punitive, that punishes, because uh, justice demands that the wicked be punished that fairness demands that the uh, evil be uh, rewarded with punishment for what they've done. The other side of the coin of God's justice is restorative, and that is what we see in verse 18, uh, that God does what is right by the poor. God is concerned for the victims of, uh, of those uh, guilty, wicked that have harmed them. So God's punishment is, and judgment rather, is both punitive and restorative. We see that Psalm 7 and 9 have some similarities in terms of how they end. Psalm 7 ends with a, a statement of praise, and Psalm 9 begins with a similar statement, which suggests that Psalm 8 perhaps was inserted between them by the editor. Both Psalms 7 and 9 and 10 are about God's judgment, and uh, I think a clear distinction you can make is that well, Psalms 3 through 7 are generally laments about David's personal enemies, Absalom, and uh, uh, men that uh, betrayed him during that season of his life. Uh, Psalms 9 through 13 are primarily about societal concerns, national issues. So uh, laments over societal and national uh, trials. Now moving to the lens of Jesus in the New Testament. When we look at verses 7 and 8, we can't help but think about Jesus and the, the judgment that he will have when the nations are gathered before him. Jesus says he'll separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Nation judging will take place in that moment. 
Verse uh, 10 reminds us of what uh, the New Testament says about God never leaving or forsaking us. This is stated multiple times in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 31.6 is an example of that. But Hebrews 13.5, quoting Deuteronomy, says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Verse 13 reminds me of Psalm 24. We'll say more about this when we get to Psalm 24. But uh, just file this in, in the back of your mind, this gates of death. Uh, that Jesus was lifted from the gates of death. And there's a possible reference to that in Psalm 24, these ancient doors that are lifted up. Some interpretations suggest that these ancient doors were, in fact, the doors of death. So file that away until we get to Psalm 24. Uh, Psalm uh, verse 18 reminds me of what Jesus had to say when he preached his sermon in Nazareth, his hometown. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So Jesus is good news to the poor. And verse 12 reminds me of uh, the book of Revelation and the cry of the martyrs. Uh, Those who have been killed for their faith are crying for vengeance. And uh, verse 12 reminds us that God does not forget their cry. He is mindful of them. As we think about the application of this text, again, I come back to verse 4 as, as the key verse of this psalm, and that is that we need to trust in God's justice. Uh, I think about this when I think about in a more recent history of the United States and the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King, uh, who, who said, and he quoted an earlier abolitionist who said this, and that is that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. God has programmed this world towards justice, and it may take us a long time to get there, uh, but that is the end. That is the end of it all, because God is the judge, and justice will be done. This psalm also reminds us that just as the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, so should we, as believers, be a stronghold for the oppressed as well, that we need to spend time with the poor and uh, we will see that God, in fact, is their stronghold as, uh, as we come alongside them and strengthen. Verse 11 reminds us of the call to be engaged in God's great mission. There are many of these texts in the Old Testament. When we, when we read that word peoples, we should see nations and people, groups and languages, and uh, see that we're called to tell among all the nations the glorious deeds of God. And the final verses are, in fact, a prayer for the nations, a prayer that they would be judged, that God's justice, God's righteousness would come to them, and that they would know that they are but men. They would be humbled by the reality of God.